Okay, once again, thank you so much for inviting me to this. Uh, Simon and all the uh, Sonom for your team. My first time in, in Grass, and uh, I'm impressed by all the students. You are, you're ob obviously the smart guys. A bit stupid going up this early in the, uh, on a Sunday just for this, but uh, I think you've already understood stood what lies in the future of medicine. Ultrasound is definitely going to be a bigger and bigger part of, of our work. It's uh, definitely become that since I finished my training and started doing ultrasound. So I work uh, in Sweden. There's, um, the emergency medicine speciality is not fully evolved. Julia is working on it. Uh, it's going to be uh, it's up and coming. But I uh, I work. Uh, I have, my specialty is internal medicine. But I work in the ER for about half of the time. Uh, and in in a step down or chest pain observation unit where we have lots of different patients where we have non-invasive ventilation arterial lines and a bit more intense intense observation uh, available we also do stress tests and lots of proper echoes as well so that's my my daily work we uh, run courses in Sweden as well, preferably in Japanese bars and stuff like that. I don't know if anyone has seen any pictures. My, I might show it afterwards, yeah. So <coughs> this is, um, maybe you're too young. No, you, you recognize who this is. Do you know who it is? Yeah, Spock. He is full of very wise words, of course, but, uh, but change is definitely uh, a thing that has to come and has to, which is a bit hard to get in medicine, you know. There's so much tradition and uh, this is how we used to do it and it has been working well. I have been using my stethoscope, pretending that I hear anything, anything and almost everything, but that's not true. So uh, many of my colleagues say that if I, if I don't bring my stethoscope to the work, I, I, I won't mind as long as I have my ultrasound by me, right? So uh, that's definitely one of the changes for me. And then you save money because you don't have to buy a, a stethoscope instead of a 50,000 euro ultrasound machine. All right, next slide, please. <coughs> Ultrasound is a bit difficult, especially in the beginning, but if you're smart, as you obviously are, and some people some, some people in Uppsala or in, in Stockholm, where I come from, this is my daughter. This is how we spend Fridays usually. <laughs> she's already done with all the abdominal and, uh, and cardiac scanning, so she's now into teeth, teeth scanning and stuff like that. Next. <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about shock, and um, some of my friends, since, since some people here were putting everything on Facebook, and suddenly I got messages, what, what do you mean uh, from friends that aren't working with medicine? And they said, what do you mean with a shock patient? Are they afraid, and that's why they come into e the ER, or have they seen a bad movie, or whatever? But as you know, how many, how, how many knows this, the definition of shock? Have you, are you familiar with it? Somewhat, okay. <clears throat> so mainly the, I mean, the typical patient is someone with low blood pressure, tachycardia, high respiratory rate, and most often, at least in our countries, it's due to septic shock, right? Uh, cardiogenic shock, next slide. Cardiogenic shock is also not uncommon. Hypovolemic, of course, especially during summer or if you've had a bleeding or something like that. But then we have also obstructive shock. Do you, do you guys know what that is? Anyone? I'll turn off the mic if you don't want to. Cardiac tamponade, yeah. Anything else? Sorry? Pneumothorax can be that, yeah, because of the elevated pressure, yeah, yeah. And there's one other big important thing. Yes, yes, 
So anything that sort of blocks the outflow from, from the heart. Yeah, so P, uh, tamponade, and uh, as you said, the tension pneumothorax, that's one of the uh, big things, yeah, yeah. But then, of course, we get all these patients with undifferented shock. They, it, the uh, ambulance is going to call in and say, we have a patient with low blood pressure in shock. No idea. They don't have a high fever. They don't have a, a mach machete, machete in their chest or a gunshot or whatever. So we don't know. And that's especially then uh, ultrasound can help us. And I'll, I'll try to show you a couple of tips on how, how to think about this. And uh, then together uh, we'll, uh, we'll focus afterwards on the cardiac scanning because I think that's one of the imp most important part of, of this. But, we, but I'm going to focus on the uh, latter part of it. All right? Working? Thank you. Could you just press play? Move it. Pulse is almost gone. How is he? Severe heart damage. Signs of congestion in both lungs. Evidence of massive circulatory collapse. Just don't talk. I'll speak. Take it easy until we get you back to the ship. What is it? What's the matter? He's dying, Jim. We can make him comfortable. But that is all. You don't know. You're not a doctor. Internal injuries. Bleeding in the chest and abdomen. Hemorrhage of the spleen and liver. 70% kidney failure. He's right, Jim. Being a doctor has its drawbacks. I always wonder. So you see, already in the 70s, already in the 70s, and in, on the USS Enterprise, they did some advanced ultrasound scanning. Eh? Who knows what that that ultrasound machine is called? Transponder, right? Good knowledge. All right. It's hard to tell how, how, uh, how uh, to give a, a perfect uh, percent of kidney failure with ultrasound, but otherwise I think we can do the same thing as Dr. Spock do, right? Hopefully after this course. Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, I, I have that one. <laughs> All right, but nowadays our, our machines look like this, right? And it's perfectly fine to, to use those machines for m m almost any questions that we might have in the recess room, right? If we find something obvious, pathology, uh, some pathology, we might want to switch up to a bigger machine just to, to get better images or quanti uh, quantify whatever go whatever's going on, especially when we're talking about cardiac ultrasound. All right. So, uh, <coughs> You know A, B, C, D, right? Uh, how you should work. You're taking care of the airways, breathing, circulation. Has an, anyone been working with those algorithms? You're familiar with it? Okay. When I started using ultrasound in my hospital, I got a complaint, a written complaint. When did A, B, C, D actually become U, A, B, C, D, right? Ultrasound A, B, C, D. So now I'm a bit, I'm a bit careful about that. I try to... Uh, to use ultrasound after any letter, right? I don't start with it, because you don't want to get anyone worried that, that you miss anything or do it as it's supposed to be, right? If you haven't, but I hope you have, listen to these guys, right? It's all free, the, the books is free, are free as well, and they're actually quite fun. And they're a uh, uh, great inspiration for me, and we do uh, lots of stuff together. So, uh, and especially if you can't sleep during night, I just put put on one podcast, and you're definitely going to be asleep later. 
Who, who loves this curve? I definitely didn't, at least when I was in med school. But now I think I finally understand it when, since, I st uh, since I began with ultrasound. Okay? Can anyone can explain to, to us what is it, what does it actually mean? You don't get the explanation. What's the thing with the Frank Stalin's curve? Somehow the relationship between the preload of the heart and the ejection fraction and contractibility of the heart. So the uh, <coughs> so uh, on the top here we have like the stroke volume, and here's the the preload or the filling of the uh, of the heart. Okay, and depending, this is supposed to be a sick heart, right? Some something that doesn't have as good as a uh, force by a, any reason. Just may, might be just normal systolic heart, heart failure. And the thing is here, what happens if we give the heart more preload? What, we give it something more to work with, something to pump with, for example, how much better or how much more is the heart going to pump up? I, it, it's a bit like a balloon, right? Because in the beginning, it's, it's hard to fill, and then it gets a bit easier, and then it's going to explode, of course. <laughs> right? So you want to find the perfect... The uh, whole idea with re resuscitation in, uh, in a patient that has hypotension or that might need fluid we, is to find your perfect, your perfect uh, spot on this Starling curve to give them or remove fluid or help the, uh, help the heart to pump more or give them more blood or whatever to find your place on the star, uh, find the optimal uh, place on the Starling curve. I don't know if you agree with this, but finally, yes, <laughs> he agrees. No, but uh, and of course we're not going to stand there and I mean draw up the Starling curve and, and guess this is where we are. But at, at least have some have some physiology in the back of your head while you address sick patients, right? Because that's how it's going to become much more easy for you to give them the right treatment. <clears throat> Years ago, <clears throat> it was like a standard thing to, well, the patient has a septic shock, so we give them at least four liters of fluid, and then we'll wait and see, okay? Uh, it didn't work too well all the time, right? Because some patients don't even need more fluid. They might need help to remove the fluid or, so, or something like that. But with ultrasound and with some thinking as well, I think we can optimize the, uh, the, the care of these patients much better. <coughs> this is another picture that I, it looks so stupid, but uh, this is actually, it, this is supposed to be <coughs> the total blood volume or the vo volume in your body. Sometimes the patient's gonna have a lot of volume, and sometimes the bucket's going to be over full, and sometimes it's going to be empty. But especially in a patient with heart failure or cardiogenic shock, what you want to do is to turn off the tap, right, the preload. We don't want to give them more preload, uh, but we want to increase the afterload. So we, the drainage should be higher, and the preload should be turned off, for example. And sometimes we need to help it draining with giving them drugs that will help the, uh, the heart squeeze better or, or empty itself better. Or just release the, uh, the tamponade that's around it, which act as an, uh, s sort of an inverse inotrope, of course. Do you guys follow this? You look, the, you look a bit bored. Is it boring? No ultrasound images yet? All right. This is a case from my hospital. <clears throat> Does anyone know what TIPS is? <clears throat> is when you, is, it's when you put a, it, it's a transhepatic uh, 
peritoneal shunt, if you have, for example, some kind of liver disease, and uh, do you follow me? And you just put a, do, do you know the uh, German word for it? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's at least to to um, to uh, help the liver with the uh, venous venous out uh, venous off flow or something like that, right? You prepare a shortcut. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You just do, you put a tube and prepare a shortcut <laughs> in the liver. In the liver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in patients with sometimes with cirrhotic liver diseases or whatever uh, liver disease that that is affecting the. Uh, <coughs> the uh, venous um, circulation mainly. Okay, so this guy got one of these shunts and he's waiting for a liver transplant. During the, the, the day, he felt sick, he got fevers, sh shivers, general sickness, feeling, and uh, dyspnea. So he c comes in with the ambulance, not feeling wet at all, high respiratory rate, low SATs, and the blood pressure and, and heart frequency tells us that he is in what state? Shock, yes. All right. His abdomen is distended and he's, he looks like a proper Michelin, Michelin uh, man, right? Really edematous. So the ambulance uh, staff couldn't get in any, any lines, any catheters, anything like that. This is the dream patient for someone who uses ultrasound. <laughs> what we did, first, we had a look at the heart. It, it was quite small, and his, his uh, IVC was quite small, so we knew he, he needed fluid. Even though, if, when you're looking at him, you'd be really careful giving him fluid, because he's so swollen, and, and his breathing sounds like shit. All right? Next thing, we examined his abdomen, and so he had, of course, since he has a liver failure, he had humongous amounts of, of uh, free fluid in the abdomen. So we could just drain that, because that's also going to affect the breathing, of course, and might even affect the circulation. If, if the tension in the abdomen is high, <clears throat> it might also be one of the sources to the infection. Right? So we could send a culture, we could send a blood gas on that even just to see if there's any lactate in it. Next thing, he had lots of pleural effusion, right? Same thing there, put in a drain, send it off to the lab for culture and, and even uh, blood gas analysis. And a good thing it wasn't any blood either, right? <clears throat> While one guy was doing all this, the other guy was uh, putting in a large catheter in his groin because that was the only way we could access his, his vascular system. We got a um, arterial line here, but it was impossible to feel any pulse, of course, but, but ultrasound helped us with, with that. And then, so we stabilized him, sent him, sent him off, to, uh, off uh, to the ICU, and the ICU staff said, uh, We've never received a patient with so many lines all over uh, coming up to our ICU, okay? But all the lines were, were uh, where they should be and working and actually helping the patients. All right? Are you a bit, a bit, a little impressed of this or not, don't care? All right. You look so serious, that's why I'm going to keep on saying this. And please, please stop me if you have any questions or anything like that. All right, <coughs> now we're going to New York instead. <coughs> this is a, a young patient. He's a, she's a female bus driver with, what does SOB stand for? Not son of a bitch, but... <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, yeah. And CP in this, in this scenario? Sorry? No. L a bit lower. Chest pain. Chest pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chest pain. Okay. So, and what medications are uh, is she on? Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> and she smokes a lot, okay? But she's, her vital signs, they're crap, right? Much worse than the other guy. If you pretend to use your stethoscope, you won't hear anything. And they even continue on doing that. But she's definitely in sinus tachycardia. We could see, we could see that, right? So what do you think? What's going on? Someone, you said uh, pulmonary embolism, why? Mm -hmm. She is. Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's a good suspicion in this, in this age, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Same thing here. We, g we gained access. I'm, I'm going to keep on talking about this because I think it's, it's not as fun or cool as, as, I mean, finding a tamponade or anything, but I think it's almost even more useful to get all these accesses. And it's nice, we're making, uh, it's nice for the patients as well. They don't need to get stung by, by a, a get needle sticks like 10 times. We can actually see and get the venous access and recess them s straight away. Same thing with a anterior line. Has anyone tried to get, in, get an anterior line without anesthetics? It's not super comfortable, right? I mean, I wouldn't. All right, so we continued on and looking, and where do you think we started to look? What organ? Yeah, the heart. Is there any way we could turn down the lights on the uh, screen for a while? Yeah, perfect, perfect. <clears throat> so this is a sub siphoid or subcostal view of the heart. And uh, Dr. House would actually be super happy because this was not pulmonary embolism but lupus. It was why I thought it might have been quite fast. No, yeah. your thinking is right, but uh, yeah. as both of you said, it just she suddenly tipped over, right? But this this must have been evolved for a couple of days, maybe even months, because the heart has been adjusting to this, right? All of us would be dead now if we evolved, if we if we got this. If we don't get Stefan, uh, it's simpler than the heart has been adjusting. There is a sac around the heart, and the, this tissue is very tough, and this tissue will not dilate in, a, in an instant, but it can dilate if you put pressure on it constantly. So it's just a matter of dilating of the tissue around it. All right, so lupus this time. And um, I mean, the, the treatment for her symptoms is quite easy, right? Take out your, your longest needle, use ultrasound to guide the needle, and drain it, okay? 
and then she's going to feel fine. <clears throat> okay. For, um, for shock, there's so many protocols out there, right? There's, we're going to talk a bit about the rush protocol, there's ACEs. Every country and almost any hospital in, in, in the States is going to have their own, their own system. But almost any of these protocols cover the same thing, right? We look at the heart, how it's beating, what's going on there. We look, we search for free fluid or fluid that shouldn't be in a, in a place. Uh, we look for pneumothorax. <coughs> We look at the IVC to uh, somewhat assess the, the volume status of the patient. We look at the aura, and um, and uh, in some uh, in in some protocols we look at the veins as well to scan for DVT, right? And then you can sort of add anything to this, right? Depending on the on the patient. So, and I I read in another book that that. You should also, and that's also what we try to teach at our courses, have an idea of differential diagnosis before you start scanning. Don't just go to the patient and, and see, well, I don't understand anything, so let me just scan. That's like the, la the, the last thing you should do. Sometimes I, I even do it because I don't understand anything, of course, but the best way in the recess bay is to have a couple of questions. Does the patient have a tamponade? Does it look like a PE? Might it be bleeding in the abdomen or, or something like that, right? It's going to help you so much and also get you focused on checking off all these checkboxes that might help the patient, right? <clears throat> this is a template from, uh, from uh, my friends up in Newcastle. They have a, <coughs> if you see it, they have a tra trauma route here and a non-trauma route here, but they're almost covering... Same thing. <clears throat> you recognize all this, right? And if you... This, uh, this is a slide from WinFocus. They're great. Uh, they have so many great ideas, but then here they actually... Just, just to, to show what you actually can do with ultrasound during A, B, C, D, E. You're not supposed to do all this, of course, but have you seen when, when you look with ultrasound and see for an intubation? Which is kind of cool. All right. So, I mean, if the car breaks down, the, the normal thing would, would be to, to look at the engine first, right? If you know anything about engines, I don't, so I would be stuck, but I, I know some ultrasound at least. <clears throat> so there's a different acronyms for, or things to help you with th these templates. And we're gonna talk a bit about Rush. Uh, there's actually, there was actually two competing uh, maybe not competing, but anyway, to, to a group of set of colleagues that came up with the RUSH protocol almost at the same time. And w one group called it that we should have a look at the pump, the tank, and the pipes, and the other guys are uh, using something that's called high map Heart, IVC, Morrison's pouch, pouch the aorta, and uh, uh, pleura pneumothorax. <clears throat> Same thing. And this is a, a template that shows us the findings in the heart, in the what they call the tank, that includes the IVC, lung, and abdomen. <clears throat> Pipes, of course, is, is uh, uh, mainly the aorta and uh, uh, per peripheral veins that might contain uh, DVT. I'll um, I'll give you all this these things, and so you can uh, give them out to the students afterwards if you want to. Hmm? <clears throat> 
Okay, not to ruin your lecture, Stefan, I just wanted to show how, you, how quickly we can actually see something if we start looking at the heart, right? <coughs> What's going on here? Is it pumping bad, super bad, or quite okay? Super bad, yeah, that's the right, the right question. Okay, this one then. Bad. Good, super good. When I hear the word, it is super. Super stupid, no? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> it's pumping really, really good, right? Is that a good thing? No. It's, pu it's pumping itself empty, right? And <clears throat> so, why one of the things with this is. This is a sign of hypovolemia, right? The, the heart isn't filling enough. And imagine, you know, the, the black thing in the middle there is the stroke volume, right? So this patient actually has a very small stroke volume. The ejection fraction is almost 100%, right? But that's not a good measurement because especially when we resuscitate the patient, we want to think about the stroke volume, how much blood is coming out from the heart. We don't care too much about the ejection fraction. That's, of, of, course, a, of course, a part of it, but think about the stroke volume, right? <clears throat> and uh, so this might be the uh, bus driver, right? If, if uh, anything, everything sh uh, was as it should have been, right? In the normal case. A patient with a pulmonary embolism, right? Very <clears throat> enlarged right ventricle, and a small left ventricle with a D-shaped uh, septum. And we're going to talk a bit more about that afterwards. And here, once again, same patient. What's going on here? Have you heard of electrical al alternance? Yeah? Swinging heart? Don't you think it's swinging a bit? Yeah. You can actually, I don't know if this is true, but you can see that some of the, there's a bit difference with that, yeah. And that's a reason why, because the heart with every beat is swinging back and forth, coming closer and closer and, and further from, from the ECG electrodes. And that's why we get the uh, electrical alternance, right? Do you, do you guys know what that is? Different heights on the QRS complexes in tamponade. All right, we'll talk about this later, all right. So non-cardiac, right, in shock. We're gonna talk a bit, a bit about the IVC. Fast, you've already covered in an excellent way. Um, and then a couple of things about the chest. For pipes, we scan the aorta the femoral and the popliteal uh, TLV, if we have indication, if we have time, something like that. Might this be a patient with a pulmonary embolism? Uh, scan for DVT if you find it, and you find a, a, a dilated right ventricle, then the diagnosis is almost clear, right? Of course, we can look for pipe rupture, then we're talking about the aorta and aneurysm, or if we're lucky with ultrasound. As you know, ultrasound can't, uh, we can't say for sure that there's no dissection, but sometimes if we get nice, uh, nice images of the uh, water, we can find the dis dissection. <clears throat> okay, so IVC for central venous pressure or just assessing the volume status of the patient. So the diameter of IVC differs with inspiration in a non-intubated patient, right? So, and if you have a lot of fluid in your system, it's gonna, the IVC is gonna be bigger and 
has have less uh, inspirational va variation. And on the contrary, if you're hypovolemic by any cause, it's going to be small, almost might even be hard to find. This is just a template, uh, just an idea of how to assess the IVC. And we'll show you how to find the IVC, of course, if you haven't been practicing, practicing that already. But this is how I use it, at least. Is the IVC bigger than two centimeters? And is it moving, is it collapsing less than maybe 50% or, or just less? Then I'm not too worried about the severe hypovolemia. But I, I know that I hopefully can give a bit more fluid if, if, they, if the patients seem to need it. If the IVC is small and has a lot of collapsing, then I keep on giving them fluid or blood or whatever they, I think they need. <clears throat> Are you following this? Can we do the light thing again? Could we turn on the lights again? It doesn't show too well, but here's the IVC, the patient's breathing, here's one line, here's one line. Does this patient need, need fluid or not? No. I'd be careful to give him, give him more fluid. At least have a look at the heart for, first and see what's going on there. But never use the IVC alone. Always use it with the heart, right? <clears throat> but then this, this patient has uh, blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 90, and the IVC looks like this. Fluid of, or not fluid? Yeah, give them lots of fluid. And then go back and check, right? After you've given them a bolus of 500 cc or up to one liter, go back and check and see what's happening with the IVC and the heart, of course. All right. <clears throat> so now we, we come to something that's called holes in the tank, right? Something's leaking, right? There's fluid, there's fluid where it shouldn't be fluid or someone or, or the uh, pleura is punctured, right? What does the arrow point at? Oh, really hard to see that. I'll tell you, this is the liver, here's the diaphragm, and there's black over there. And you can see something that we call the spine sign, right? So it's pleural effusion, right? We'll go over that later. All right, you, you already know all the fast views and how to acquire them, so let's go on to the pipes then. <coughs> pipe, pipe rupture, you usually can't see if the aneurysm is, has ruptured, ruptured already, right? But you can find the, the, uh, the aneurysm. And this might be one of the easiest scans to do, right? Have, has anyone tried to scan the aorta? Yeah. But there are a couple of tricks to, to get rid of the gas, to really move the probe fa fast back and forward, to move, move away the gas, and to ask the patient to distend their belly and then just jiggle it down a bit, and then you might, might find, find the aorta much easier. And it's a good thing because most of the gas is usually higher up and most of the aneurysm are close to the bifurcation, right? So, and as soon as you have an aneurysm, it's usually easier to find. And here they put some pressure on it just to see that the order's coming up here, right? And in this setting, I wouldn't mind on, of any bifurcation or any fancy small arteries coming out from, from the aorta, of course. We're only interested in the big, important things, right? And soon, when you're standing in the ER late night shift, you're going to 
find this on a patient that were seeking for a severe lumbago or something like that. But the blood pressure wasn't. He also syncope, uh, syncope, uh, He also passed out the day before or something like that. There are some hospitals uh, that you, where you can't discharge a patient over 65 with first time renal colic or lumbago if you haven't scanned their aorta. Which might not be a bad idea. So if you measured this uh, abdominal uh, aneurysm, aortic abdominal aneurysm, where would you measure it from? Is it here to there, there to there? Have you been talking about that? No. So it's only always from the outer lumen to the inner lumen. Because what's this gray thing inside? Sorry? Thrombus? Thrombus, yeah, yeah. yeah. So don't miss that. Don't do the mistake of, of measuring just a false lumen the here, because it's actually all this. And the thrombus gets evolved because of the low flow, and suddenly it's... It's collecting eryth erythrocytes and the inflammation as well. <clears throat> okay. And then, of course, in the setting where it might be PE, scan for DVT. A super quick thing to do, and usually you just need to do the femoral site and the popliteal uh, site. Most of the time you're going to be able to see the DVT, which is here. You're going to see inflammation around it. But the, you might say uh, one of the biggest criteria is that the vein shouldn't be compressible. But almost all the time you see the uh, thrombus as well. Everyone following this is it a DVT? All right. <clears throat> so this is one of the ideas to how to, during resuscitation, I, I don't know if you've heard about the uh, fluid responsiveness thing people are talking about now, how to assess, the, the, can the patient make use of more, more fluid uh, while we're, um, while we're uh, resuscitating them. And... Uh, this is one idea, to keep on giving them boluses and go back and check the IVC. You can do fancy measures of the heart as, uh, and some other things as well, but this is an easy way to have a good overview of what's going on with your patient. It's also one idea of actually giving fluid until you see B lines, because that's a, quite a quick change, right? So give fluid, and then when the heart can't make use of fluid anymore, B line's gonna evolve, and then take care of the B lines, or just stop it, all right? Do you guys have any questions? I'll, uh, if you're interested, I'll give you these slides with some references and stuff like that, how to find the different protocols and, and things. Do you want to go ahead and... Well, uh, thanks a lot, Christopher. I think we'll take a quick break now, so about 20 minutes, and then we'll go ahead with, with, uh, with Stefan Harp and with Christopher Moore still on stage. And it will be a quite interesting lecture, the next one. And yeah. 20 minutes. Thank you.